But yeah, where we were at was uh, what methods of prototyping to use. And so actually, I'm going to go ahead and jump into FigJam. As we talked about the periodic table of prototypes, I wanted to talk through a few examples. And so this part, I'll be going through five kind of key areas or different types of prototypes that I enjoy, uh, as well as some other examples. Uh, and this section, I'm just going to kind of be nerding out about different types of prototypes that I've seen that I really love. Uh, so feel free to you know, throw post-its in, add comments, uh, do whatever, and uh, feel free to have this as a conversation. Okay, so let's let's go ahead and check out some of the examples. Um, and so this top row is probably what y'all might be the most familiar with from mockups and visualization to tinkers and rapid prototyping and role play, which is, is one of my favorites. Uh, but let's go ahead and spend some time on mockups and visualizations. But yeah, the first one that is probably the most common one that we see all the time is mockups and visualizations. And so this is really incorporating drawing, sculpting, and building into the ideation process, which can unlock all kinds of different solutions. Uh, and actually, this is uh, the content here is from ideo.org design kit. So you can feel free um, in, after the class, like feel free to click on the read more, and it'll give some more details. Uh, around these different styles of uh, prototyping and these different methods of prototyping. But for mockups, let's see. So some of the examples I have down here, uh, one of them here is from the IDEO Toys Instagram, which is a spin tool toy that we played around with. And this showcases the toy invention process and how we love to build prototypes. Even just drawing is kind of a way that we love to make prototypes, right? When we were brainstorming, we originally started with just this twist tool. Like this is all that the idea was. It was just a post-it note. And then from there, uh, we actually practiced this idea of we start on the two by three post-it when we're doing brainstorms. And then after the brainstorm, we vote on which one's our favorite. And then we take a piece of paper. So um, an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper or standard American sheet of paper. And then we draw out like what might be the different mechanisms of it. And so you can see, you know, here's the mechanisms, you know, you twist 120 degrees to reveal new tools that, you know, this is how the tool mechanism might work. And again, here you're seeing like the basic aspects of the invention. It's not getting into too detail, too much detail. And it's really the broad strokes of what the idea is. And then even just that, you can see how some of the final ideas of like the web shooter or the, um, you know, the dial end up in the final toy. And this is actually a toy that's available in the US. It's a spider. I forgot what the name is called, but this is just how, you know, it, things can go from a drawing to a sketch. And then there's actually a prototype, a uh, foam core prototype for this. And then we record a video of that. And so this is the idea of how sketching, you know, works for uh, prototyping. But then also uh, animation is one space that I really love to utilize uh, for better visualization. And so this was one project where we were designing um, a entryway wall for our new building. And then uh, we weren't sure like what ideas, we were thinking of different ideas. Okay, we have a, a big wall, what could we cover it with? And so I utilized After Effects uh, animation software to kind of create this idea of like, okay, what if it, we, we already had an idea of like, what if it was butterflies? Uh, that use the a mechanical engineer proposed butterfly that use nitinol wire, which is this um, wire that when it's heated up, it activates and it makes it look like a very natural butterfly movement. And so what I did was I mimicked the footage of one of these butterflies and I used After Effects to composite it and show like, okay, what does it look like when there's 160 butterflies? And then through that, we got like an initial idea of like, oh, okay, like this works. And this was a really um, you know, my background with an animation. And so this made it so this was a really quick prototype about an hour or two to make. And then, but then afterwards we were like, okay, what other forms could we make? And then we evolved that design, uh, did an iteration in Blender, which you see above. And then this version is actually in Unity. And with Unity, we were able to then program it so we can actually see like, okay, if the butterflies moved at a certain rate, what, would, what difference would it make in animation? What might be the way that we would actually have convert a picture into a butterfly image? And so this was kind of uh, different ways of uh, fidelity being utilized, uh, being kind of converted throughout different programs. And this is just an example of like how we did that uh, with visualization. Another form of visualization uh, was around mockups. And uh, they, these mockups might not be kind of what y'all are used to seeing. I really love to use mockups in this way of uh, really, really simple. Uh, we call these sacrificial concepts. Uh, again, taking from that story of a person that's willing to rip pages out of, the, of a book. 
we uh, create designs that we're willing to uh, get hated on. And so this was a design for this fitness app where it's kind of showcasing your performance. And, you know, we play with this idea, we're showcasing, you know, what are different ways that we can tell a person that their workout was good. And so we were like, what if we did the dumbest idea possible? Where it just said like, did you perform your exercise well today? Yes or no? And what if that was just the entire app? And it was a really dumb idea, uh, but we got a lot of great conversation because we started to hear from users. Oh, actually like, I want to know a little bit more, you know, why, why did I get a, a yes of like why my workout was good? Why did I get a no? And then we knew like we wanted to focus more on that aspect of the design. And then below we had this other idea of like, hey, what if it was like a plant that, um, you know, would grow and showcase, grow alongside your fitness journey and show you how well you were doing. And then with this, the question we were asking was, is a metaphor or some kind of story helpful for folks to better understand this thing around fitness. And then we discovered that actually story is something effective, not necessarily plants, but story is helpful. And so we utilize that insight throughout the rest of our design process. And so you'll see that these were nowhere near what the final design of this product looked like, but we like to leverage, you know, again, for prototyping, it's really putting your questions out there and using these different assets to ask different questions and have that reasoning out in the world so you can communicate it without your, throughout your team as well as communicate it um, as a, uh, through, with your clients and with your users as well. Uh, one of the things with visualizations is that it's effective for communicating and embodying some things, but we'll find later it's not as effective for you know, testing out interaction testing out ways that people might naturally react to something. Um, it's a lot of like people reacting to something and saying something, but it's not the best to be used uh, for later down the line. You want to, you know, move past visualization and kind of evolve to something that might be more interactive, which we have some more examples of further on. Awesome. I love the examples you're showing, Takashi, because I yeah. feel like it's a perfect example of the different fidelities, like starting on paper and moving to the mm -hmm. screen and then potentially animating everything that you have. And I feel like it's a reflection for the students, like most of them are graphic designers. So everything mm -hmm. that you learn in graphic design, you can potentially really apply in prototyping as well when you're testing any product that you're designing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and even like you can see here, I am very, very conscious of using blue and light blue. I use this almost throughout every project. And the reason why is because it looks really ugly. Like it is a badly designed interface, but it makes it so folks are like, it looks like blueprints. It reminds folks of blueprints. It makes it more comfortable to give feedback because further designs, right? Like it, it, we can add the shadows, we can add the rounded corners. We can really prove out that, you know, we know how to design things. But during this phase, it's really kind of taking a step back and being like, okay, I don't want to design it to be perfect. I want to design it so that we can have a conversation around it and folks are willing to engage with it. And actually a great example of that is even this kind of level of sketch, it's, it's an industrial design sketch, right? It's something that only a few folks are able to uh, do, but it's still inviting you know, some kind of feedback. You're not going to hurt anybody's feelings when you're giving feedback on this level of design. And so that's really kind of, a, 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 I might add that as a key takeaway for a future talk, but that, that is like one of the big things with the difference between navigating high fidelity versus low fidelity and really figuring out as well, um, you know, with the software that you're using, this is actually a great example of that. Uh, with the software that you're using, you really wanna be conscious of like what aspect of the software is dictating how your design is coming across with Figma, you're able to really quickly get to high fidelity, but you know sometimes you want to actually be consciously uh, making it so you're not taking all those shortcuts and you want it to be that low fidelity and be really strategic of how you're approaching that and how the other person would interpret that. And that's like a real empathy exercise whenever you're doing design like this. Thinkers, I think, is like one of the most classic examples of prototyping and Lilia, feel free to you know throw in any details if I'm uh, going you know uh, through too many assumptions around you know the content. But for Tinkers, this is probably one of the most popular ways that IDEO is known for prototyping. This is using physical objects or bare minimum material to make a playable prototype. So uh, in the toy invention process, uh, you saw that you know we start with a post-it sketch and then a full sheet sketch. And then you actually see here, uh, this is a, I'll start on the right side. This is an example of a toy we invented uh, a while back where it was, we started to create 
uh, this is a great example of we created a foam core prototype or something using cardboard. Then we use 3D printing to our, you know, emphasize what it might look like. And then this was the final product that was created by the toy company. And then you can see the works like prototype was built so that, there we go, it's loading for the GIF. So it's this idea of the flip out car and like to communicate that is kind of hard. And so we created this really quick uh, foam core prototype that just showcased like, this is how the mechanism would look. And then that mechanism worked to the, you know, the, then afterwards it's uh, answering questions of like, okay, how do we make the mechanism work? What's the engineering like? As a design team, sometimes that's not the things that we need to figure out, but we work with mechanical engineers to figure that out. And so again, this is all about making sure that you're focused on the challenges that you know your skill set is really good at articulating, and then bringing in other folks from the team that are able to help you on those other details that you might not be able to best be equipped to cover. And so this is one of those ideas of a tinker using bare materials. But then over here, this is a great example of using prototyping or rapid prototyping or tinkering with found objects. This is a really famous IDEO case study of, you know, we were designing this surgical tool that you see on the bottom right. But the initial design uh, was just using an XO marker, a canister, and a, uh, a clothespin. And with this design, it was uh, in this meeting, it was like kind of around all these surgeons trying to figure out what the design would be. And this prototype took just a few seconds to make. So what it allowed for folks to do was then hold the object and then imagine themselves in that scenario of like, okay, if I'm holding the surgical pen, you know, would it be uncomfortable for my wrist here? How would I be kind of, you know, maneuvering it? Uh, oh, what if this clothespin could actually move? And when you put something in someone's hands, it allows for them to kind of create new ideas for themselves. And again, that's a huge part of what we want to do when, again, inviting folks into the process. You want your users or your clients to be thinking alongside you of like, Creating these new ideas and putting something in their hands is kind of an age old practice that really helps for folks to imagine new scenarios and new ideas, which leads to one of my favorite forms of prototyping, which is role play, which I'll get into in the next section. Now, role play is often like not thought of as a prototyping tool, right? We're not using a program to do role play. Uh, role play is really like a way to test out experience by getting into character and acting it out. Uh, and this is always like very much looked uh, underlooked as a, a great way to prototype, but it's honestly one of my favorite ways to prototype and something that gets overlooked often. And one of my favorite case studies of this is the Elmo Monster Maker iPhone app. And this was uh, this is actually an, uh, the group that I'm a part of, the Play Lab. This is a toy invention that we made. So this is Adam. He actually, he's uh, my boss. And uh, here you can see that, you know, he's showcasing some of the monster moves that the monster does uh, when you tap on the phone. When you tap on the phone again, it changes its moves. And then um, when you tap on it again, you know, it changes its moves again. So it's just showing like a really simple interaction here. Uh, and then, you know, you click on the bottom left corner and then it makes it stop. The great thing about this prototype is it took like 10 minutes. It just took paper. And then Adam is standing behind this giant sheet of paper and acting out all of these scenes. And this is like a really famous case study for uh, how role play is really effective, right? Because it, if they were to program this idea, um, if they were to program this idea, it would have taken a long time, especially this was made, gosh, I believe in 2008 or so. I don't know like when it was made, um, but yeah, it was, if they were to program this back then, it would have taken a developer team to create this, you know, and that you have to invest so much into that idea before you can just test it out and communicate it. So this is a great example of like just printing a large sheet of paper, you know, standing behind it and acting behind it is a great way to role play. And I actually love to do this with uh, the modern day version of this is you can actually use a software like I'm using today, OBS. You can put yourself within a frame, you can act out things on screen, and that's a great way to do things on Zoom or to do things remotely, uh, to do this almost exactly same role play um, you know, in 2022. And so this is a great example that I always love sharing. Um, it's a really great way to role play. And then on the right side, we have uh, how role play might be used with, um, with clients or users. And so with this one, uh, this is another project, this is an older project, but where you know we were interviewing nurses and then we had Play-Doh, we had uh, uh, all these different like Legos and objects, 
and we had the nurses like create you know this new idea of an interface or a device that they can use and then they would role play out like what the scenario would be of like when they would use this and so role play it really is like it captures a lot of what how you would use tinker prototypes or other prototypes but i think that role play is really powerful i've used it um, especially on projects i don't have any photos here but uh, on projects that I've done for service design, I've worked with CEOs. The first day I worked with the CEO of Cup Club, she was like, uh, we were launching the service that day within um, a coffee shop. And she was like, I don't know, like what are the different challenges that the barista is gonna face? Like what are different ways that they might, you know, have difficulty selling the cup? And I was like, okay, let's just stop talking about it and let's act it out. And I just went full into character. I act like I was a barista, I was like, what do you want? Yep. Do you want a cup? Yeah, sure. I'll give it to you. And like acting it out in that way and like playing with the scenarios is a really effective way to break out those kinks. Cause then we were like, okay, like let's change this part of the script. And it's like, let's act it out again. And it's like, oh, let's change this and act it out again. So these are some of the powerful ways that role playing and kind of getting a little bit silly with the, um, you know, the way that you're having conversations with folks and putting yourself into character can actually be really, really powerful. All right. So let's dive into two other ones where again, these are all like kind of mixes and merges. And so they're not really perfect categories, but another quick one I'll go into is Wizard of Oz. I'm not sure if y'all heard of Wizard of Oz before, but this is one of my favorites. Uh, again, I, they're all my favorites. I love prototyping, so it's just a lot of fun. Um, but Wizard of Oz is a concept, it's similar to role-playing, um, but what it is is you're um, adding an unseen human in the loop to uh, a seemingly automated system. So one case study uh, for this is the um, IDEO's work with LA County voting booths. So with the LA County voting booths, we were designing uh, you know, these automated voting booths. And with that, we wanted to make sure that we were designing for accessibility. And so we wanted to design for um, folks who are vision impaired. And so with that, uh, on the right side here, you see, um, this is actually a great uh, photo of the case study, but uh, what it was, was uh, they had a participant who was visually impaired uh, in front of the uh, prototype kiosk, and they had a pair of headphones on. The user was speaking kind of these different commands to the uh, telephone uh, or to a phone that was then um, another design researcher was on the other side and acting out what the automated system would be doing. And so what you see here on the wall is a decision tree. So it's like, if the user says this, do this. If the user presses this button, say this. And it's kind of this fun, if y'all have ever watched The Wizard of Oz, that's where it comes from is when, you know, the curtain gets pulled, you see it's just a regular person behind the curtain. It, this is what I like to also call this digital puppeteering, but it's this um, way of prototyping. It combines a little bit of role play, but it's where you have a human on the back end that's acting out as what you're programmed you know, code might be doing, but you're just acting it out. And you can then quickly iterate, right? Then you have the next participant come in and then you just change up the script a little bit. And then you have a new participant come in and you change up another detail. And this is where you can really rapidly prototype versus before what you would have to do is you have to program, right? You'd have to code in the new command that would be set. And so that's a great way to iterate. It also invites, you know, rather than having a barrier of entry for folks who can code, it can make it so that anybody can come in, jump in, and then you know change up the design as well. And then uh, another example of this is a project that I was a part of where we were designing a, a new massage room, which is actually this prototype here. So this is actually our looks like uh, prototype. Um, but within this design, what you see here is we had another model where we had a LED screen where this orange post-it is. And all the LED screen could do was to make GIFs. Now, this was definitely a more high fidelity prototype. Uh, but what we did was the LED screen, rather than uh, making a touch screen, we just made it so it was displaying different GIFs and images, right? And so what we did was we had another team member who was great at working in Unity. And then we had them make a Unity app that you can actually swipe and utilize. And in this video, what I'm doing, the reason why it's so close up on my hand is because in my other hand, I'm holding my phone and I'm swiping the exact same way I'm swiping on the Unity app. And it's just updating on the model itself, like what the screen is. And so this way we didn't have to program all, we just had to program it. So it was a screen that could display certain GIFs. And then on the other side, we were Wizard of Ozing it, right? We were just had it so it looked like I was swiping here and doing stuff, but really it was my left hand that was swiping and doing all the action. So it's a really great technique to make it so you can kind of like bypass 
some of the challenges it would be to like make a full-blown prototype. Wizard of Oz is kind of like supplementing the interactions in other ways uh, using, you know, ways that are easier to make it. And you'll see this a lot in Figma as well of like, you know, manipulating things in the background. Uh, it's a really fun prototyping technique um, to, to consider within your designs. Thoughts around Wizard of Oz. It's a really fun one. It's, it's one where you can be really creative with, uh, you know, how things are set up. It's one where it's a lot about like working with your team. So your team is kind of on the same page. It's like, okay, let's try this experiment in this way. Uh, and here I actually have a link to kind of the history of Wizard of Oz. It comes from a research background back in the 80s when they were doing research around automated systems. So it's a really fun, it has a really fun history to it uh, as well. And it's just a, it's a cool way to test, especially AI automated systems uh, or voice interfaces is probably one of the most common ways to use it as well. But it, it's, a, it's a blast to, to be designing in this space. Awesome. I'm going to go ahead and jump over to live prototyping, which is probably one of the biggest beasts of uh, design, but one that I absolutely love. It's uh, probably the one that I've done the most uh, throughout my last two years. Uh, and especially one that I've done in the sustainability space. So if you all have any questions around sustainability, circular design, uh, I believe that live prototyping is like the way to test things like circular economy or businesses that really require not just a one-time interaction, but multiple interactions across uh, um, a life cycle. Before this example, this was uh, the NextGen Cup Challenge, which was uh, this project. Again, I referenced it earlier, but it was working with Cup Club. Uh, we were working on live prototyping their returnable cup system uh, throughout the city of Palo Alto. And we were in four uh, coffee shops. We were in Stanford. We were in downtown. And with this, um, the cup club system was a system where there were these cups that you could borrow from any coffee shop that we were partnered with. And then the user would scan the cup. They would take the cup, you know, utilize the cup as they would. And then they would bring it back, hopefully, and return it in the bin. And so what we were doing with this prototype was uh, testing it out. What were the areas where it broke? What were some of the aspects that were necessary for this system to work? And throughout the life cycle, if you think about that life cycle of somebody, you know, getting awareness about the cup, taking in the cup or uh, borrowing the cup and returning the cup, there's a lot of moments that can break really easily. And then we found like when we started it, it's like, okay, like awareness, like folks are not uh, aware of this cup existing. And so uh, even prototyping, this is where graphic design is really strong in prototyping is a lot of it came down to messaging. Like it was me kind of going, printing, you know, these new flyers at the office, cutting them to size, and then creating like a thousand of these. And then we would leave them at the coffee shop and we would watch how many people were interacting with it. And if folks would grab it, we would be like, okay, like, uh, we would go up and approach them and be like, do you understand, you know, what the system is, what's not working? Uh, and even in the Beyond the Bag project, which was another live prototype, or live prototype, live pilot that I was a part of, we did the same exercise and we quickly learned that a majority of our customers didn't understand the writing because they were mainly Spanish speaking. Uh, and that was just based on where we were piloting. And so we were like, okay, we need to reprint all of these in Spanish. And uh, we quickly iterated, changed the design, and then we saw how much of a difference that made. And that made it so one of the learnings was multilingual is going to be absolutely vital if you're uh, doing a reusable system like this. So maybe paper printouts might not be the best. Maybe digital campaigns are going to be better because it's easier to do multilingual there. And so that's kind of the ways that you can extrapolate thoughts from a, a small a change in design and then evolving it out of that. But yeah, live prototyping was a lot of fun. Some other techniques we used with Alto, you know, we partnered with Tafia and Cup Club and their developers. And so uh, their developers were in France and we were in the US. And so we would communicate design to developers and they had a great team that was able to, we would change small features within the app and they would launch it on the uh, Google Play store, which has a faster um, approval rating than iOS or Apple. And so we would actually do that where we would actually find our, we had like a group of users that were Android users and we would kind of continue to go to them and be like, hey, can you update your app? And then we would ask them like, what is the difference? Like, how does that work and see? And we would find those power users and work with them and then change the app design. And so when you're doing a live prototype, there's a lot of different levers and you're pulling in a lot of these different ways of uh, prototyping from role play to tinkering. Um, this one, I ended up being for a week, I was the janitor 
of this system. So I would actually be calling the cup and like taking the cups. And when I was doing that, I was recognizing like, oh, okay, we need a more efficient way to deliver the cups. And then we ended up prototyping this ridiculous contraption, which was this cart that would carry the cup. And this also helped us because we would bike through Stanford with this cup uh, cart and people would be like, well, what the heck is that? And then they would ask us more questions about it. So it also worked with awareness as well. So you can really get creative when you're in a live prototype. It's this environment you get to play with and create things really quickly. And then uh, you assume the role, even though you might be the designer, you want to assume the roles that uh, on, within your service that you might be hiring out for. So even for this, because I was the janitor, I was seeing how people were returning the cup. I noticed people were returning the cups right side up versus upside down. And we found out like, okay, we need to fix that within the industrial design because people were pouring liquid in. Uh, I got covered in coffee and chai tea. And so we knew that, you know, we needed to redesign this or else whoever's going to be responsible for taking care of this is going to get splashed with coffee like I did, and we need to fix that problem. And then another fun technique you can do in live prototyping, this is a technique we call the well-trodden path or desire path. Um, but if you all haven't heard of desire path, they're a really cool concept of this idea. If you've ever been on, you know, you've seen like a college campus where you have all the sidewalks, and then you see a dirt patch where people are actually walking, that's what's called a desire path. And so we took that idea and then we had it where for certain users, when they downloaded the app, we would ask them, hey, can you also download Strava, which is a running app that tracks, you know, where uh, folks are, it, it tracks your runs. And then we took that data in and we said, you know, turn off the Strava run right when you return your cup. And we saw where most of the desire paths were emerging. We saw that a lot of folks were actually traveling from, you know, certain coffee shops and a majority of folks were actually sitting at the city hall in Palo Alto, drinking their coffee and then returning their cups at the city hall point. And so it's a great way, like again, live prototyping, you can bring in this as techniques of programming. Uh, actually, it's not even programming, right? We just used an app like Strava and then we just told the users, hey, you know, do this one thing. And then we put it into the data visualization, but it's a way that you're able to really play around with this environment when you have a live prototype functioning. So yeah, I could talk all day about live prototypes. Any quick question or any kind of ideas around live prototyping or piloting? Again, this is a space where I found the most energy, a lot of kind of where prototyping can be really strong is when you put things into the market um, and then have it so folks are actually able to interact with it and break it. That's the, again, one of the best things with prototypes is people breaking it and destroying your design because that's like what you want. You want them to break it so that way when you build it into a product, it doesn't break, right? It, or it, at least you're, you've covered or you've thought about those different spaces. You never know how folks are going to interact with it unless you get it out into the wild and you have that chance to run your solution uh, and get that chance for folks to really, you know, break that thing apart. So those are some of the five, like four examples, but I have a few more examples down here of like simulations, which is similar to live prototype, but it's more so you know, creating something and then walking somebody through that scenario. So this is one where we're working with a pharmacy and, you know, walking them through a physical space, but also another one of utilizing not human beings, but utilizing, um, <clears throat> utilizing uh, like encoding uh, uh, what humans might be doing. And so this is an example of, you know, folks walking between the clinic, the waiting room, the medicine room and the pharmacy. And this is supposed to be animated, but what this was was, changing the variables on the left side of how folks, fast folks were moving, what the average patient load was, what the capacity of the room was, changing these different variables and running the simulation to see like how humans might uh, engage in this environment and what uh, variables might actually like affect them. And so with that, uh, that's like changing the design so that, or using simulation as a tool to where you can test in an environment that doesn't have humans in it yet, but then you're able to better design for, you know, when you want to put humans in that space. And then a few other quick examples, ad campaigns are a really fun space to prototype when you're uh, prototyping a venture. I mentioned this earlier, but social media campaigns are like a great way to uh, test this. So we did, we've done this on a lot of projects, but this is great for testing your uh, business value prop. It's really quick and cheap to do. Like you can, for, you know, for, with your team, get 10 bucks, you can get a few hundred people to uh, engage with your social media. And what we would do is we would post two different campaigns. So even here for PillPack, there is, uh, you know, one Facebook ad said, 
uh, we're prepackaged all we prepackage all your pills so you never miss a dose. And this one, you deserve better. Treat yourself to pill pack. So it's this idea of like which value prop is more helpful. This idea of like you'll never miss a dose, or you know like hey, you deserve the ease and convenience, and so like buy it in this way. And then we can track how many people are clicking on which ad. And then we can calculate, you know, which one is more interesting or which ones uh, does the market have a little bit more interest in. And a little bit more advanced version of this is building a, a fake website where you actually have like, if a person clicks into it, then you click into it. And then you can see like a little bit more description of pill pack. If they scroll down, you realize like, okay, this person's really interested. And then you can ask them a little bit more of a gnarly question. Like we usually at that point ask them pricing. We'll have like tiers of like, pricing tier one, pricing tier two, pricing tier three. And then if they click on like one of the pricing tiers, it's almost like a vote. Like they vote on like which one they're most interested in. And then always at the end, we we want to say like, hey, you know, this was an experiment. If you're interested in talking more, we would love to interview you. And we've actually gotten a lot of great interviews through this because it's the folks that are just casually, you know, on Facebook or Instagram, you know, looking through content and then this actually stopped them. And so this is one technique of prototyping. It's a little bit different prototype of a prototyping an ad campaign uh, and testing out things. And we used to do this a lot in person, building brochures and, you know, going into a mall and creating a fake stand with permission from the mall, of course. But like, this is where visual assets are really powerful is like, you can really kind of create, it's a lot around creating these kind of worlds and environments that folks can engage with. And then, you know, be honest, like, you know, this is a prototype, we're testing things out. And, but you can really gauge like how many folks are interested in things. And so this is another thing that you can test uh, with prototyping as well. But yeah, there's also, yeah, there's coded prototypes, there's pitch testing, uh, sacrificial concepts, business model canvases. There's a lot of different things. I've uh, linked in the Fig Jam uh, a few different resources that y'all can go ahead and check out. Design Kit, which is one that I've referenced a lot, uh, as well as the IDEO Toys. Instagram is a great one to follow for lots of different toy focused um, prototyping. And yeah, just feel free to check out that content uh, and feel free to add any ideas to this Fig Jam board as well. But yeah, those are all the examples that I had. So yeah, would love to hop into, you know, more conversation and hearing more about, you know, what y'all have been up to.